Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Mastering Midlife, How to Thrive When the World Asks the Most of You. I am your host, Mark Silverman. Today, you know, I am the luckiest guy in the world. I meet them, I know and meet the most interesting freaking people on the planet. And today is no exception. I get to talk to Allison Crow, who is a former top real estate agent. She was so good that she was made a coach of the real estate agents. Then that she was made the coach of the coaches of the real estate agents. So the woman is a what we call a recovering overachiever. We're going to talk about that. Right now, she is a, a better life, better work coach. She's uh, what's known as an irreverent high priestess. <laughs> I know her best. Uh, she's the mom of Leroy Brown, Clementine, and Rocky Potato, the three dogs who you might hear snoring in the background. And she's got an incredibly creative and uh, husband named Bill. Uh, Allison, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be a part of this lineup. Like I just see all your guests that come through. And then when you asked me, I was like, oh, I'm one of the cool kids. <laughs> you are totally one of the cool kids. You know, you and, you and I have been on a journey now for the past five years together. Uh, and, you know, we've grown as coaches, we've grown our, uh, in business, but both of us come from the world of, you know, high achieving in the mm -hmm. office. You know, you talk about going from your pencil skirt and your, your blown dried straight hair mm -hmm. to, you know, now paint on your face and, uh, you know, open hearted. Uh, can you share the origin story? Let me, let me make this, let me work on my conciseness while keeping my humanity because I'm an ever evolving human being. And I love like mastering midlife. I'm, I'm here in this new incarnation. Um, I always thought I'd be a wife and a mom of 10 kids, five of mine and five adopted. And that I might like work in the church as a, um, a college pastor's wife or something. That's a plan though. I love the hover achiever. Five, 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 no, five of my totally own kids. Plan, right, right. And like I was, I was overachiever. I was all state MVP of my basketball team in high school. I had great grades. Um, and I went to graduate school because I didn't have the husband. So I started getting this graduate degree and I was going to go get my PhD. And I applied to a school that only had 10 spots. I had been a nanny in college as a job. And instead of spending another $36,000 at the time to get my PhD, I got offered a teaching job. So I taught at a Catholic school. This was like in my mid twenties. I taught at a Catholic school. And um, as a kindergarten teacher, I brought my computer to school and the school didn't have computers except for the principal. And I would like steal their, we would, sh the principal and I shared a phone line <laughs> and they made me, he was like, can you come be the technology coordinator for the church and the school, like the whole organization. And so I, you know, fitted out that whole school with computers because I was a total computer dirt and door before any of this was coming out. And, um, one day my husband left, I got, I finally got married at like 29. My husband left at 31. And uh, he walked out the door on a Wednesday, two weeks after I had gotten my real estate license. And I got it just because I thought looking at houses was fun. And my dad had been a broker. And um, I was like, well, hell, I don't know how I'm going to keep this house. But however this works out, I'm going to keep this dogs in these house. And so I started, you know, I asked my employers, I was like, I'm leaving. I'm going to sell real estate. And my boss at the time was so cool. He was like, will you be the technology coordinator and computer teacher? And you can sell real estate. And I said, well, I want to go to this meeting. I want to do this. And I want to be able to tell everybody that I'm in real estate. Like, I don't want to have to hide this, which was great for, I didn't know that I was in sales, but I was already selling my position of what I wanted to do. So I created, you know, I agreed to stay for a semester and I started selling real estate and I kicked ass at it. I kicked ass at it. I had a blast. Um, I got very competitive with another one of the quote new agents and I ended up 30,000 in volume shy of rookie of the year, which is like a lease. It's not even selling a full house. And the sweet dude that beat me worked 90 hours a week and used to be the main newscaster here. And I was like partying my ass off on a boat. <laughs> apple and I was playing on the lake most of the time and so I was like dude I didn't get the plastic star but I had a life totally different life now so I did really well at that 
And they asked me to be, the company was an international company. They were like, we want to start this position of sales coaching for agents in the office. And we want you to be the first one of the international offices. And so I did that for two years. We did really well. We kind of started and built this program internationally. And then um, they asked me to be the coach of all those coaches in the local offices. And so I built this at the time it was called productivity coaching and it was sales coaching. It was sales coaching and training for um, new agents and then training a bunch of coaches how to coach sales coaching. And so I did that for two years until, um, I, you know, so I, I learned coaching in the corporate and I learned like, all the regular sales terminology and the way of doing things, but my experience as a coach, thank you for listening. I told you it was a little bit of a long story, but we're always growing and changing. My experience as a coach when I was in those two real estate positions um, was that the more we had life conversations and soul conversations, the better results my clients got in their sales. And uh, so, I, you know, I started re-exploring my own spirituality. I started exploring my own soul and my own inner development. And they did not like that at the company. They did not, they just didn't like it. I didn't like it at the company. And so there I was recovering overachiever because I wanted to be validated. And I am so thankful for these two lady bosses that would not validate me because I finally recognized, oh, I need to validate me. And as soon as I validated me, I said, I left and I'm gonna go coach my way. And I started um, coaching business and life from there. I, you know, they were like, why are you leaving us? We did so much for you. And I was like, yes, you did. And I'm going towards me. And so I have been business and So life. wait, so can you, just, can you slow down there? Cause I think we might've missed it. What, was, yeah. what, gave, you, what gave you the courage to shift? You said something about finding, finding confidence in yourself. Can you just slow that piece down? Yeah, thank you. Um, well, the first time I wanted to leave was when I was that local coach. And I actually did quit. Um, that's how I, you know, I quit and they kind of seduced me back. I quit. I was like, oh, I you know, I quit out of I can't do this. I ran away. Like I stress response. I can't handle this anymore. Very young. And I was young, like so much grace for that young lady. And then I went back for the second two years. And part of that was I was newly married to my second husband. I didn't want to lose that relationship. And we were living on my income, which was a lot. And um, my husband is a retired school teacher who has had a paycheck on the last business day of the month since he was 19 years old. And he grew up in a military family that had the same. And so I, I'm a risk taker and he's a security guy. And so through this time, two things, I wanted my husband to trust me. I was like wanting to start my own business. And I was wanting these two women to validate me. And honestly, it was the Byron Katie turnaround. It was like, Bill should trust me and lady one and lady two should validate me, hmm. they should appreciate me. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, I should trust me. What would I do if I trusted me? And then same thing, what would I do if I validated me? So I remember like the first time I quit, I'm trying really hard not to give the bird and not to, you know, not to be tacky. I'm, I'm to, to be, and I was, but that was in my being. And the second time I quit, it was so beautiful because I, I'm, you know, I'm having to quit to the master of handling objections in sales. Like people are so intimidated by her because she always had some response that just put you in the ground. And why would you leave? And I just said, I'm not leaving you. I'm going towards me. And that woman was silent. She, she could not object to that. And so not only my believing that and giving myself the validation, but then the reflection from this woman that always had something to say, couldn't say anything, was the beginning of, was literally the first step in a slight shift in the way I beat in the world was like, I give myself everything I want and then I get it from others. And that's what's really formed the me falling in love with myself, my confidence and my okay with my insecurities. And so that, that wasn't, that, that sounds like a fairy tale 
But what I know is that's a bumpy ride. Because well, that's why I said okay with the insecurities. Because I don't want anybody to assume. I am both and. I am, every day my capacity is increasing on both ends, the shadow and the joy. And the more I create in the capacity for earning and joy and freedom, the more I create capacity for the discomfort and the grief and the sadness and the fear. And so that's why I say, yes, I'm wildly confident, but I am wildly insecure. I am up and down. And the difference between then and now is that I'm, I'm more okay with it most okay. days. Thank you. Yes, because because not always. Because because it's it's so funny because for the last five years you're the person I call when I feel like crashing. You're the mm -hmm. per, you know I go through a frenzy of productivity or I go through a frenzy of success and then I have then I contract, and you're the one who taught me about the expansion and the contraction and to be okay with mm -hmm. being on top of your game and not being on top of your game. And you know if if it hadn't been for you, I would believe you know, all of it and, and ride the roller coaster horribly. And you've really given me the opportunity to, to see that the roller coaster is part of the success. Yeah. I th it's so I, I'm a, I'm a personality type that when I'm afraid, I shove things under the rug and I'm growing out of that. Um, and and I, one of the reasons I attached to the personal development world very early in my like 19 or 20 at a bookstore, I was like, oh, this feels good. And I was reaching for the feel good, but I was bypassing whether it was spiritual, whether it was alcohol, whether <laughs> it was uh, coaching or pop personal development. I was bypassing all the shadow feelings and through art, it's a whole nother story for another conversation through art. I was able to actually learn how to feel these uncomfortable feelings. And now I can see that life is awesome and shit. And somewhere along the way, we were taught that life is only awesome. Well, then when the shit happens, like a family member dies or politics gets weird and shitty, or you know, when, when something human happens or when we feel off or tired or depressed or anxious, it's the end of the world and our, we don't know how to hold space for it. When actually I'm learning that the shit of life is sacred. And can you imagine, like, I always think of a kindergartner. I, I don't know why kindergartner, because in my mind I make up, they, they went to school and got spoiled. <laughs> hmm. Like, they're innocent. But coming home from kindergarten and saying to mom or dad or whoever is taking care of you is, is you know, mommy so-and-so was mean to me and mommy instead of saying so-and-so is a jerk saying it's okay for them to not like you do you like you you know yes that's like that's normal so there's a lot of people that aren't going to like you in the world or there's a lot of difficult things how would you like to take care of yourself in this moment would you like to breathe which what does your body feel like and you know i know those are abstract thoughts for a five-year-old and yet we were taught something different. We were taught that everything should be fucking perfect. Yes, should, there should be part, right? It's, if it's not, yeah, if it's yeah, not, we've yeah. done something wrong. And even even in the new age world, if you don't have money, you haven't manifested correctly, right? Your your chakras aren't yeah. clear. So now yeah. we got to go fix that shit. And yeah. uh, so we we you know we've we've put in a fundamentalist religion for fundamentalist uh, new age thinking. Mm -hmm. You're just not doing the law of attraction properly. <laughs> That's this whole thing, like we're not doing it right. And I'm I'm going through another layer of like, oh, it's exactly like I can get my panties in a wad about politics. And then I go, oh, it's exactly as it's supposed to be. Now I don't mean that it doesn't make me an advocate or thoughtful or whatever. And I so I can see both ends. I can see the human, I can see the divine, I can see the messy middle. And I'm um I'm working on being a more curious and contemplative human being about myself and the world around me instead of a should, a judging machine. Because I only create suffering in myself, in my business, in my life, in my being when I'm judging it. Mm, yeah, ju judging, resentment, all that stuff, although it, it, ha it comes with a, with, a, with a shot of um, energy uh, mm -hmm. and otherness uh, really, really is the poison we're drinking ourselves. 
Well, and I'm so thankful for the judgment I've had because if I weren't so, you know, if I weren't so mad at my mom and dad being that my mom, that's not fair to use them. If I weren't so, you know, at one group being judgmental, well, I'm judging the judgers. I'm the same damn thing. And so I'm so thankful for my strong feelings of hate because how else would I clean them up by, by looking at somebody and going, you're not being right. And I am. And the most humbling things, but we, we have a saying in my coaching group. Um, I realize that your audience is like traditional professional and <laughs> I get paid, but I'm me. So we have a saying like, when somebody's being an asshole, oh, somebody's being an asshole. And we go, oh, I'm being the asshole. And me accepting that I'm an asshole, that I'm judgmental, that I'm racist, that I'm homophobic, that I'm critical, that I'm all these things. And you can see, the podcast listeners can't see, but I have a big grin on my face. Like, I love that I'm an asshole. She's so innocent. Bless her sweet little heart, like we say in the South, <laughs> right? And so I, I realize that may be confusing, but it's something that I'm contemplating, like, oh, and how can I love my shadow side and see yeah, that? So when you're talking about this, so to help the audience a little bit, uh, in, in her book, Debbie, Debbie Ford, The Dark Sh Side of the Light Chasers, that was a really good um, and very practical introduction for me, for what you're talking, the abstract, is basically... What I see in other people is if I don't, if I hate it, it's disowned in me, right? And, if I, uh, and, uh, and to actually look at the things that really bug us in other people and to find that in ourselves so we can learn to love that in ourselves. Uh, so it's, it's Debbie Ford, The Dark Side of the Light Chasers. Really brilliant book to step into some of the concepts that uh, Allison's talking about. Awesome. Yeah. I, um, I, it's, it's been one of the greatest, it's most stressful and most painful, but the most liberating thing I've ever done is to untangle my judgment of others. And my, our friend, Barry Brandon, has the phrase, be unoffendable. And unoffendable isn't about defending. It's about, you know, realizing that other people have the right. I'm not there to run their manuals. And what I mean by manual is, I'm not in charge of you. You have the right to do whatever you want. Right. I mean, you know, it's, funny, it's funny that you mentioned Varian. Varian's going to be on the show. Uh, and Varian is a very, very devout Christian. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, if you go to your website and you see Varian's uh, testimonial of you, and she said, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Alice, Allison cusses like a sailor. I don't. Allison is a, is a former Christian. I will always be a Christian. You know, Allison is this, I'm not. And Allison and I are 100%, you know, in alignment. We're best friends. Right? Well, I mean, she's one of my besties. Like, we both say, we're on this journey together. I ain't leaving you. But what's beautiful about it is, you know, when I first got to be friends with Varian, uh, I'm like a beaten dog with Christians and me living with a man, me being gay. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, by the way, it's never been my direct experience. It's only been my experience in the media and in politics. But in my direct experience, Varian being a Christian, you know, I cried when she hugged me and just said she loved me because mm -hmm. that healed something in me. You know, she can, she can yeah. still have her beliefs about the way I live and not a judgment comes past yeah. of who I am. So There's not an ounce of energy. I, I, I've never heard her express a thought. Every once in a while, I'm like, well, do you have those thoughts? But, that's, but I'm using her as an example as the, uh, the freedom of what you're talking about. To be a devout Christian and have really specific and very important beliefs and values and to let everybody else off the hook for your values, to be able to be in relationship and close relationship with other people is the definition for me of freedom. Because her relationship with herself is so strong. She, as a Christian, would also attribute that to her relationship with God. And it's also her relationship with herself. And I have a little saying, like I've been giving myself permission for the past five or six years to be self-centered. Because when I'm self-centered, everything in my orbit benefits right? Like the work, my world does revolve around me and I contribute to the world both locally in my house with my husband and my family, 
my neighborhood and to the global world when I'm a center being. I, uh, you know, this politics stuff has been such a teacher for me because it, I could not depress down feelings any longer. I could not depress down fear. I could not depress even the, the little uh, eight-year-old who just wants human beings to get along. Like that's just such a part of my nature is I, I was born knowing that we're all one. Mm. There wasn't a religion. I just was born knowing that there was this spirit, whatever you want to call it, that this, there was this infinite love and that we're all a part of each other. And so it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's scary to start to dive into shadow. I haven't read Debbie Ford's book. I know you recommended it to me a while. I haven't, I haven't read it, but it's like, even this morning I was like, or yesterday, I've been doing this 40 days of prayer for a soulful mogul because I'm really channeling the mogul business energy, but I really know that my divine business manager and my soulful part wants to be a part of this. And I was like, oh crap, you start praying for the next 10 days and spirits start shuffling the shit around. Um, but yesterday it was about reflections and I had taken a selfie where I look really cute, but it was like, is this a selfie or is this a reflection? Because I'm so experiencing what we just talked about, that reflection. I, I experience the reflection in my clients. I experience the reflection in my own judgment. I experience the reflection of the energy that I'm cultivating in my heart is showing up everywhere in my world. And so asking spirit to help me go even deeper into discomfort feels like the dumbest prayer in the world. It's like asking for patience. And I know that increasing my capacity for discomfort, for sacredness of uncomfortable feelings and thoughts sets me free. That's such a beautiful message, you know, for, for, for midlife. So mm -hmm. for, for me, for midlife is when the way life is supposed to be, the way life should be, the way we've mm -hmm. been conducting our life no longer is sustainable. And that could be internally where your heart is looking for something different. It could be externally where you lose a job, you get sick. So, you know, for, again, like you were just talking about when politics became too much, that's when you got broken open. Mm -hmm. Midlife is when those uncomfortable feelings of it's not going the way I wanted it to go or the way I thought it should go. I'm uncomfortable. Now, what do I do with that uncomfortability? Do I run? Do I hide? Do I change my partner? Do I, you know, what, what do I do? You know, where, where men seem to blow things up, right? Uh, and they, that'll, that'll handle things. So for, you know, when you talk about the uncomfortability, uh, Brene Brown talks about the great unraveling uh, mm -hmm. and, and how painful all that is. So when you mm -hmm. say the capacity to sit in that uncomfortability is when, for me, when I start to listen to life and which direction it's nudging me. Exactly. I'm, I'm also learned too, like it's actually really biological and simple. So I call it midlife. You can have a midlife crisis or a midlife awakening. Both burn shit to the ground. <laughs> um, I feel fortunate to have had my, like my crisis was after my divorce. That's when I, you know, was crazy and I did all the extreme things. And you were only in your early thirties. I was in my early right. Career. Midlife does not, is not an age. It's, I think it's just a time in life when, when there's a pivot. And, you know, that was the outside world disrupting me. And now it's my inside world disrupting my outside world. And learning the concept from biology of the nervous system and the stress response. So we do, I say four things. Um, medicine says three. We fight, we flee, or we freeze, right? And you say men tend to blow things up. Um, I tend to freeze. No, I don't freeze. I do not freeze. <laughs> I will either cut your throat or I will run and we'll burn it down. I will. So mine, and I used to get really volatile because I was shoving stuff down and it was so much easier to feel anger than it was to feel fear. Mm. And what's fascinating now is like, I can recognize, Oh, I'm in the stress response. Like literally as an observer, Oh, I'm in the stress response. I'm trying to not feel an uncomfortable feeling. And just by rec, I don't have to recognize the feeling yet. Just recognize that I'm fight, flight, 
don't freeze. The other one I call is frothing, just a little plug for frothing. I think frothing is where people, um, my girlfriend, her dad died recently, and this, this came out in a conversation with her, her dad died, and she was, her sister could be in tacky, and you know, here I am trying to comfort one of my best friends and her dad just died like four days before. I know she's in grief and there's money issues with the estate. And all she is doing is whining and crying and fussing about her sisters. And I it was like one of these moments in our friendship and we have permission to kind of be coaching with each other. And I just said, Tracy Lee, I have permission to share this story to you. I said, Tracy Lee, may I say something that is really coming through strong? And she said, yes. And I said, I think you are, I know that you are standing in the shit and the grief of your dad's death. And he was your beloved. And you are daddy's little girl. And I know that your sisters are being super, I'm not going to say this word, but we say the word cunty. Your sisters are being super cunty. Um, and yeah, you're gonna have to put an explicit rating on this. Uh, Trip Trip already set that precedent. Oh, of Earth course, I did. He's my brother from another mother. Um, so, and and I said, but here's what you're doing. You're instead of just standing in the shit and feeling the shit, you're picking it up and smearing it all over your face. You are frothing in the shit instead of feeling the grief of your dad. Mm. And so I want to ask you to stop frothing. It's okay to let your heart break. I will hold you. You know, our friends will hold you. All these things are happening and it is real. And please feel that instead of making, so we make up a drama. This is, this is the classic midlife, right? We create drama. And we know that going out and buying the car, having we know that buying the, the car we can't afford or leaving our spouse, we know that that is going to create drama. It's not like we think, oh, I didn't know I'd lose my family if I had an affair with the nanny. We know that. Even though we feel good, we also know that it's a train wreck. But we're, it's easier to feel the train wreck than it is to feel the undercurrent of, I don't know who I am. What do I really believe? What am I really feeling? And so I'm so thankful for the simplicity of biology. I mean, here I am totally a woo spiritual person, but the simplicity of science and biology says, of course you feel that way. And so all we have to do is get back to the stress. If we can learn to get back to the, the relaxation response, then we can begin to think and feel these feelings. But we're trying to do it from, from war. I can't, I can't create peace from war. So I create peace through contemplation, through breath, and then I can explore from a neutral place instead of in inflammation. Ah, so much wisdom. So, I know, I'm like, I'm like Buddha or something. So my this, friends calls me Chick Nhat Han. Chick Nhat Han. I'm, 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 the, I'm the friendly neighborhood guru. So yeah, <laughs> and then, there's an identity to just, to just hang your hat on. Um, so thank you. Thank you for this wisdom. I knew when we started this conversation, it wasn't going to end up in the same country that we were aiming the plane towards. But this is, this is so useful and so beautiful. I really appreciate that. What's up next for you? What are you, uh, what are you excited about? Um, you want to know what I'm terrified about? Sure. I know what I'm excited. I'm always excited about the things I'm selling because I only sell things I'm excited about. So that would be the regular answer. But literally this morning, I have decided to stop watching the news for a season. I was inspired by Oprah, actually, because I thought this woman is a mogul because I'm very into my business. This woman is very soulful. And I was listening to a conversation with her and um, I can't remember the guy's name. He wrote Christ Consciousness or Universal Christ Consciousness, the Universal Christ. And so I just bought that book and I listened to them and it, it's solidifying some things. And my leadership mentor asked a question last week, what would happen if you doubled down on your value? And I went, oh shit, there's another layer of business out the door. And so how does, you know, I always say, oh, I'm your favorite life coach and I love business and I love my way of business coaching. And when I'm terrified, and yet I know is to release another layer of the business stuff. I will still be a businesswoman. I will still probably always talk about it, but shift. I am becoming a woman whose identity is soulful, not just 
success or soulful mogul, but really focus on the soul part. And um, that's, as a business person, that's scary to put all my eggs in the soul basket because it's so nice to have a spreadsheet with the dollars. And I have an old story, right? Like the midlife story, like, oh, if I, if I peel back this layer, I'm going to lose all my money. And so I'm terrified and excited about seeing what unfolds in the next incarnation of Allison Crow. I love it. I'm so excited. You know, it's funny. I start, I, I end all my videos and uh, all my podcasts with, I love you. And the first time I said that, it stuck in my throat. Like, what am I doing? I work with executives. You know, the, I am an executive coach, right? I need to be in the business world. Uh, now it's so natural for me. And I not only have I not lost anything, my practice is full, right? Like uh, the, the it's, and I get to I get to create and live who and what I am and bring it into these glass buildings. So I, I don't think you're, you know, I, from my own experience, you're not losing a thing. And you know, you know that. I know that. And yet it's, it's funny. It's, um, it's an interesting, like I said, I don't think I can ever not talk about business because business excites me and learning new things excites me. But one of my clients said, I hired you. I, I sometimes I bring in experts for my clients and she goes, I don't want to hear from the experts. I want to hear from you. I want to hear how you built it unconventionally. And it was just a good reminder of that because I get influenced by what's going on outside of me. I get influenced by that. And so it's like, oh, what if I really trusted my spiritual way, my soulful way, my, of doing business? And it, you know, it's not just ass in the grass. I actually, you know, believe in the sales process. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. By the, by, by the way, just to run the disclaimer, disclaimer for the audience, I call Allison for business advice. <laughs> well, what I love, I, I call it the divine business manager, right? Like my divine business manager is the spirit inside of me that thinks, where's the pencil skirt? <laughs> right. So, so, it's, so. It's an interesting, I'm in, I'm, I'm becoming. Yes, you are. And you, you are, you are an inspiration. Uh, to, so I, I do your URL, uh, you know, alisoncrow.com. I uh, send that to every businesswoman I know who is looking to shift the way she's doing her business or if she's shifting her career. I send them all to you because I think everybody needs a dose of Allison Crow. I'm so glad that I have a full mm -hmm. helping. Thank you for Thank being you. on the show. Thank you for having me. We'll put all the links to Allison and all her wonderful creations uh, on the show notes so that you can find her. Uh, to everybody else, thank you for giving me your most precious, precious uh, uh, I'm losing my words now. Thank you for giving me your pr most precious commodity, which is your time and your attention. Mm -hmm. I love you and have a great rest of the day.